Well, good morning. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We thank you for your holy word revealed in Scripture and made flesh in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the way that your word and your truth are revealed in this land and for the way that they are, you are revealed in the people who inhabit the land. Thank you for the privilege of being able to have some of us present there and inspire those who were not present with the same sense of your closeness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So those of you who were here last week uh, got my brief orientation to the geography of the Holy Land. Um, And in short, there are two bodies of water. One is in the north and one is in the south. Which one is in the north? Galilee. Galilee. And which one is in the south? Dead Dead Sea. And what runs in between them? Jordan River. And on the west side of the Jordan is the... Milk and honey, promised land, thank you very much. And on the east side of the Jordan is the wilderness. That's all we need to know about the geography. Um, And what we're going to do today is have a few reports from our pilgrims. Uh, And the goal is not to give you sort of a travel log, uh, but to let you know a little bit of the reflection that took place, a little bit of the way that God was present to us. So there are going to be lots of things left out today, and we will absolutely catch them up another time. Uh, But we're giving you a sense of what it was to be there. Uh, And without further ado, I will hand it over. And Janie Morris is going to speak first. Thank you. Um, I chose a picture of us at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was a big surprise to me. I didn't think anybody got to go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, particularly a bunch of Episcopalians. And it was late into our visit. This is definitely not going in any kind of sequence. We had been plowing around through piles of rocks and dusty roads and all this kind of stuff. And I kept waiting to see the golden city, Jerusalem. I'd seen this dome from afar, but I hadn't seen the golden city of Jerusalem yet. Well, I found out it was a mosque. (laughs) So we got there. And we were given a briefing about how this came about. And I I actually contacted uh, Greg Jinks, the dean of the college, just a day or two ago. I wanted more details on how it came about. We were only the second group of Christians to be allowed to tour the mosque in a long, long time. And so I want to know how that happened. And Greg wrote me back and sent me some details, and he said, well, actually, it was Bashara, who you're going to see a picture of later in this, that made friends with somebody there and negotiated it. We were the second group to go, and he gave us many cautions before we went. The night before, we were given a whole list of do's and don'ts. We were to wear clothing that covered us from our ankles to our necks, I mean, our wrists to our necks and down to our ankles. We could wear pants, we were told, but they had to be long pants. This, this jacket would not have done. It does not cover my wrists. And our head was to be covered. Well, we got there, and from the minute you enter the gates, you are considered to be on, the, on holy ground by the Muslims. And they immediately whisked out 18 or so long skirts to cover our unholy pants. And there were at least 20 of us, and two of us had to wait a bit for some skirts. And Milton says, if anybody wants to know how long it takes, to, how many women it takes to get Janie dressed, it's four. <laughs> two to hold her hands and two to put the skirt on. It was quite a production out in the yard of the mosque. But we were taken inside. And they were under construction, so things were not quite as they might have been. But that is us inside. You can see the the scaffolding there. That is us inside the mosque. But this was a surprise to me. And I'll give you a little bit. I'll tell you why it was important to me. 
I've been following the Middle East on the news for the past, well, since 9-11 especially, very carefully. And I keep thinking, why can't everybody just get along? Why can't everybody just get along? And the, the idea that Bashar had managed to bridge a gap and that we could all just get along for an hour and a half inside that mosque meant a lot to me. So after I got that note back from Greg, I looked up a little bit more about it because the trip was such a whirlwind that I was seeing things I sort of knew about but I didn't know much about. And we would get a lecture the night before and I was usually so tired most of it went straight over my head. But the Temple Mount where the um, Dome of the Rock is located is a hill. It's not exactly a mountain, but it's a pretty high hill, especially if you're walking up it. Uh, it's located in the old city of Jerusalem, and it's one of the most important religious sites to particularly Jews and Muslims, Islamists. And Christians for a time, off and on, have revered it also. Um, it's the holiest site in Judaism, which re regards it as the place where God's divine presence is manifested more than in any other place. According to the rabbinic sages, it is from here that the world expanded into its present form and where God gathered dust to create the first human, Adam. Um, according to the Bible, both Jewish temples stood at the Temple Mount although archeological evidence only exists for the second temple. But in Israel, <laughs> there are archeological levels where they start digging and they'll find something from the fifth century and it's so wonderful that they kind of quit digging. So there may be archeological evidence uncovered at some time for the first temple, but legend has it that all, both temples existed there according to Wikipedia, which is where my information came from. It's, well, it's pretty well documented there, okay. Um, uh, due to its extreme sanctity, many Jews will not walk on the mount itself to avoid unintentionally entering the area where the Holy of Holies stood, since, according to rabbinical law, some aspect of the divine presence is still present at this site. Um, the temple was of central importance in Jewish worship. After the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, which came to be regarded by the early Christians, as it was said by Josephus, to be a divine act of punishment for the sins of the Jewish people, it lost its significance for Christians. And Christians kind of quit going and it kind of fell into rack and ruin over the next 600 years or so. And in 638 CE, the Muslims conquered that area and they decided it needed a good cleaning up. And they, um, a guy named Caliph Omar Ibn al-Khattab cleaned it up and he granted Jews access to the, to the site. And for a time, Jews and Muslims both had access to the site. Uh, it was, it's the third holiest site in Islam it's revered as the noble sanctuary, the location of Muhammad's journey to Jerusalem and ascent to heaven. The dome was completed in 692 CE, make it, making it one of the oldest existent Islamic structures in the world. The Al-Aqsa Mosque rests on the far southern side of the mount facing Mecca. The dome of the rock, now the rock we're talking about is the rock that Isaac, Abraham took Isaac to. He's referred to in Islamic literature as Ishmael, but same guy. For centuries, Christian, the, during the Crusades, the interest in this site was regenerated among Christians. And for centuries, Christian pilgrims were still able to come and experience the Temple Mount. But escalating violence against, against pilgrims to Jerusalem um, discouraged this. The Crusaders captured Jerusalem in 1099 
and the Dome of the Rock was given to the Augustinians who turned it into a church while the Al-Aqsa Mosque became a royal palace. Um, the Knights Templar, actually from 1119, identified the Dome of the Rock as the site of the Temple of Solomon and set up their headquarters in the Al-Aqsa Mosque adjacent, adjacent to the Dome for much of the 12th century. And we skip forward all the way to 1967 during the Six Day War, the Israeli flag was lowered on the orders of Moshe Dayan, and he invested the Muslim Waf, a religious trust, with the authority to manage the Temple Mount. In 1993, they covered the dome with a golden thing to, at the cost of 8.2 million US dollars, donated by King Hussein of Jordan, who sold one of his houses in London to fund it. Um, it is the Dome of the Rock is depicted in um, the reverse of the Iranian $1,000 real banknote. It's also depicted on the reverse side of the Knights Templar um, signature. In light of the dual claims of both Judaism and Islam, it's one of the most contested religious sites in the world. Since the Crusades, the Muslim community of Jerusalem has managed the site as a waf without interruption. As the site is part of the old city controlled by Israel since 1967, both Israel and the Palestinian Authority claim sovereignty over it, and it remains a major focal point of the Arab-Israeli conflict. In an attempt to keep the status quo, the Israeli government enforces a controversial ban on prayer by non-Muslims. Oh, I'm sorry. And we were cautioned not to even look like we were praying. I'm sorry, I've taken too long. In 2006, it was open to non-Muslim visitors, but under certain conditions. So we made it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Ellis, and Janie and I both had some reflections on the, um, the, this particular area. Just to put a little humor, because we did have a lot of humor on our trip, I want you to look at Milton's um, face as she looks at Barton and me in our outfits. Now, you might think that she was not at all thinking that we looked great, but she really coveted the fact that we matched in different colors. <laughs> So it was, it was an amazing opportunity to be there. And, and like Janie, I never, I'm not a biblical scholar, so I really had never realized the dimension of how much the history of this place informed what was going on today. But I think Sandy, standing in front of the mosque and in the Temple Mount area, in this beautiful part of old Jerusalem with the Western Wall being the only place the Jews can go, reflects truly what Christianity means, and that is that we pray wherever we are. And there's a wonderful quote from John that, if I can see it, I will read it, because I think it really reflects how we view um, the contentiousness and what we should all be, can we just get along, kind of like what Janie said. And it was when, in, um, when a Sumerian woman came to Jesus and asked him, where should we pray, in Jerusalem or at the Mount um, Germain? And he said, woman, believe me, the, the hour is coming, oh, my eyes are so bad, when... Um, when neither the mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from, from, is from Jesus, but the hour is coming and is now, now here when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship 
him must worship in spirit and truth. And that's from John 4, 21 through 24. And when we hear about Bashara, we really know as a Christian and an Arab, he reflects that, that wonderful gift that wherever we are, we can worship. And we were all over, um, the, the, obviously, this, the country of Israel. And I don't know whether you want me to go to the next slide. But here are Sandy and Hester at, at the Jordan River where we all reaffirmed our baptismal covenant. And it was, when you see the Jordan River, it is a very small, narrow area, probably not as far from here to our, our kitchen um, where Jim is. And it's a muddy river, um, it has reeds on the side, so you kind of imagine almost Moses in the basket with the bulrushes. I mean, it was really amazing to see the river and so many Christians of all faiths from all countries with various leaders um, actually having ceremonies at the river. And we, too, reaffirmed our baptismal covenant, and it meant a lot. And we, some of us gathered the water from the Jordan River and brought it back for babies that are going to be baptized. And you've probably seen Sandy use some of it. So it was meaningful. It was positive and um we kept Andy from swimming to the Jordan side, and he found out by going underwater that there is a wall that divides <laughs> the country. So, But it was very spiritual, very moving, and I think the whole dimension of we went here first and then to Jerusalem, and we really realized the importance of our own faith and accepting those and the dignity of every human being. So thank you. So this is a picture from the rooftop of the, uh, where we stayed in Nazareth. And so this was early on in the trip, and we're getting, you know, swimming in the, uh, swimming in the history of, um, of, uh, of Israel. And I felt like uh, I've, I've tried to be educated on, on the, the situation there. And getting on that rooftop in the nighttime, I would, I would describe it as it was, it was beer drinking weather. It was cool. It was nice. It was, <laughs> um, but I uh, got to the rooftop, and it was, it was chilly, and it was time for the Muslim call to prayer. And as we looked to, um, as I looked to the east, there was a Catholic um, cathedral that was relatively new. You know, we're saying in a site, this is, um, you know, history is all around us, and then you've got the, the call to prayer going for the Muslim faith and sort of circling around and hearing that just like we were swimming in real history. And so it gave a little context to me of our place in time that, that the current conflict is just, um, it, it helped make things feel a little bit less significant as far as the conflict and more the richness of the fact that we are all, this is a place that we have been sharing as a, as a faith with, um, with Jews, with, with Muslims, and that we have our space. And so that, that kind of helped settle me and help me maybe look at the rest of the trip with a little bit better perspective. I it's the, the, the Annunciation, I think it would be better if you were to, to, to handle that <laughs> than me. I don't want to um, I don't want to rob you of that opportunity. Uh, prior to beginning our pilgrimage in the Holy Land, our larger group was divided into four small groups, and we were required to read the book of Mark out loud to each other. Out loud is the operative word here, as it causes us to more clearly focus. Get with others. Try it. In the book of Mark, there is the story of feeding the thousands with loaves of breads and fishes. The last Friday morning we were there, we walked the 14 stations of the cross. 
Everyone stood back against their nearest wall to allow the passing of the loaves of bread. I still wonder if Sandy wasn't standing around the corner going, Lord, cue the loaves of bread and fishes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I kept looking for the fishes that never came. Perhaps he had counted that full-bodied tilapia with teethy heads we ate from the Sea of Galilee. This young man balancing his loaves of bread high above his head up and down the steps of the old city to his stall personally speaks to me on another level. At that time and still now, I've worked hard at balancing respect for the past while moving ahead or forward in my life. One member of our group brought to everyone's attention that there were four of us on this pilgrimage that had significant others who had moved ahead to be with God. And listen, I didn't say lost. Two, within the last eight months, Milton and me. And two, within the last two years, Anne and Barton. There were four of us balancing those loaves of bread, our hearts and our minds. I've always believed that as we move forward, our loved ones will always remain in our heart. And likewise, I believe we will always be in theirs. You can find that when you are by yourself anywhere, and especially on a trip when you're asked to become the cameraman for couples followed by asking, would you take a photo of me with this first century rock? <laughs> and so um, early in the trip, I decided that I would change that when I said to Anne, come over here and take a couple photo with me. From then on, I made a point of moving forward, seeing Israel for both of us and being part of my photos with my church family. A Facebook post recently said, family isn't always blood. It's the people in your life who want you in theirs. The ones you accept, who accept you for who you are, the ones who you would do anything to see you smile, and who love you no matter what. Share if you agree. On this trip, I smiled, I stood amazed and wondered, wonder. I learned that the wilderness in Israel and the Civil War Wilderness Campaign in Virginia had different type landscapes. I forgot that Sandy said, you may want to avoid the crowds leaving the mosque around noon on Friday. <laughs> and I charged right through that mass of humanity. And through all this, I realized how little I knew of the differences among peoples, how similar we are. And now my life back home must have a better balance of the Bible, peoples, religions, and my passion for history. Whether you are here at Holy Communion or in Israel or elsewhere with a portion of the larger Holy Communion family, whether it's helping balance Milton from falling into the Dead Sea, balancing yourself after a shepherd's beer in Bethlehem, or balancing yourself while you shoot a video of the sunrise above Nazareth, I know that I will always have my Holy Communion family with me, past and present, in my heart and in my presence. When, I, when will I grasp that understanding of being in the Holy Land? Each time I hear a lesson read aloud in church. And when did I grasp that I had come to Jerusalem? When my friend from Carville called me one night when we were at dinner and asked, hey God, what are you doing? I said, I'm having dinner in Jerusalem. Okay, I'm really nervous, so. Bear with me if I miss a word or two. Um, everybody always thinks of Israel as blue and white. Israel is beige and green. Everything there is beige or green. The vast, seemingly never-ending beige of the wilderness and the lush green of a much smaller promised land. And I have a picture here that didn't quite make the slideshow, which is okay. I'll put it over here. This is what I'm talking about, too. Gethsemane, it is all green. It is gorgeous. We first stood atop a ridge overlooking a deep crevasse in the Jude Judean desert in total silence. The wilderness is like that, silent, so that you can listen and hear God speak. This is where Jesus spent the first 40 days of his ministry after his baptism in the Jordan and God's pronouncement, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I know he was tempted by Satan in this place, 
But what struck me was that he spent most of his time in conversation with God the Father about what his next three years would include, how his ministry and his spreading of the gospel, the word of God, would unfold and ultimately culminate. There was the calling of the apostles, adding disciples, encounters of all sorts and conditions of mankind. These are the things that I believe they talked about. As Sandy has told us, the wilderness is where you meet God. And I felt his presence as I could only imagine their conversation that would lead to the salvation of the world. It was heart stopping to be in that place, feel the loneliness, see the desolation, and know that I was standing on holy ground because God and Christ still abide there in the beauty of beige. Soon after, we were standing on the crest of the Mount of Olives, preparing to descend as Christ had done to the small, lush green of the Garden of Gethsemane. It is probably only an acre square nestled in the shadow of the walls of old Jerusalem with its many gates leading to many fateful, fateful destinations. The contrast of the small, lush, green garden across the Kidron Valley from the city walls and that vast, barren desert of the wilderness struck me immediately. These were the bookends of Christ's ministry. This is where it was to end. I sat on what was possibly a portion of the rock where Jesus had knelt to pray throughout his final night. Looming above us was the golden gate through which he would walk to his trial and crucifixion. Picture over here. In this place, at this rock, the human and the divine Son of God had his closing conversation with God the Father about what was to come. If it is possible, remove this cup from me. Thy will be done. Save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. That's Matthew and John. Here, the reality and the magnitude of his sacrifice for me and all mankind were no longer words on a page of the Bible or the prayer book or some study guide. An all-consuming wave of thankfulness and the realization of what was to happen, what did happen, swept over me as I prayed at the rock and stared up through the olive trees at the beige of the Golden Gate. I was no longer an observer. I was a participant. I hope many of you will be able to go on the next pilgrimage and find your encounter with the living Christ and feel the reality of his love for you. It's not even beige, is it? Uh, so you might wonder why a cave was special to me. Um, put in a little bit of context, when we arrived, the, the first day we were there in Jerusalem, the next day we went to Nazareth, and, <clears throat> and we basically had followed, our trip followed sort of Jesus' ministry, not necessarily chronologically, but so we started really in Nazareth where things were Things began in many ways. And we stayed in Nazareth um, at the Sisters of Nazareth guest house, which had been a convent, I think, at one time and a school years back. Um, and it's located in the center of what had been, in the center of Nazareth. Um, you saw the picture from Andy on, from the rooftop. That's, that, that was where we stayed, the guest house. Um, and th this picture is from the excavations that were underneath the, the guest house, underneath the convent, what had been there, and the church that was there. Um, <clears throat> Sister Stephanie, who headed up the convent, led us on a tour. And 
we had heard the day before that there was a special treat, and it was very special. And she was very protective of that space, as we found out. A few of us, ran, including our rector, sort of ran astray and got sideways with Sister Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as you walk down into this excavation, which was underneath the, uh, the facility there, you saw layers, layers of history. Uh, and the first layer you saw was from the Crusades period, so 1100 to 1200, somewhere in there. And you could see the architecture of that, Gothic arches and so forth. You went down a few more steps and you could see the Byzantine level that was in these excavations that being something like 300 to 600 CE. Um, and then finally at the bottom was basically the caves, crude structures. And in that ex excavation there were several different guests, you know, I mean they were estimated several different facilities. One was a house, one was a tomb, and one was a church that was on this site underneath this. All of it kind of connected, the caves sort of connected. As we went down, um, and so it was a special place. In fact, there was a name that <clears throat> one of the churches, I, I don't remember exactly, it was not in the context of the present church there, but there was in the name of the previous structures there, the Church of Nurturing. And that nurture is something special. So the house that was underneath this, or, or the cave, which was a house, um, was one of probably... 10 to 15 homes that were early Nazareth, the early vid village of Nazareth. So 10 to 15 homes, maybe 100 to 150 people. Um, <clears throat> and it was understood and fairly well established, why were these churches built on top of this, these structures over time? What's the veneration, what, why there? Well, the, it's fairly good historical and ar archeological support that that was, that house that we saw, was the house that Jesus grew up in. And if it wasn't, it was one of the 10 to 15 homes that he certainly spent time in. And that struck me. It just really, because you know, you go to a lot of sites, and there was only our group that was making this tour. St Sister Stephanie was leading us on this tour, and there, only, there were less than 20 of us. And, and it, that night, when I went to sleep, my room was right above this excavation, and I thought, you know, I'm putting my head down right above where Jesus put his head down. And that was pretty incredible to me. Um, it also, you know, and, and while we were walking there, we were walking on ground that, that Jesus had walked on and had spent time in his youth and his, in his childhood. And the other thing that really struck me, it's, it's pretty incredible. These guys, this, Nazareth was on the fringe of civilization, really, of Israeli civilization. It was an outpost. So you got 100, 150 people living out in the boondocks in caves. You have a cave dweller who founded a faith that changed the world. I mean, you have to believe that God's hand is in that. What else? Um, so I'll close with Maybe it answers the rhetorical question in John 146. Can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> I, I will. I'm going to add just one detail uh, to this picture that Bill so beautifully reflected on, and then we'll have time for any questions, or we have a few other pilgrims in the room. If you want to add any texture, we can. Um, take a look at the photograph that Bill has chosen. You'll see that Bill and Carmen and Bashara are standing on some wooden decking. Um, that is on the Israeli side uh, of the Jordan River so that people can go down safely. And then if you notice, uh, just uh, to Bill's left, or the right hand of the image, there are some yellow dots in the water. Those little yellow dots are the same kind of floaties that you would have in a pool, marking the deep end from the shallow end. So just a series of little floats on a rope. And that rope marks as far as you're allowed to go on the Israeli side. 
and we, uh, we thought that it was just a rope. Uh, Andy Mathis then explored to find that there's a wall underneath it, and the reason that is is because that structure in the background is in the Kingdom of Jordan. And so this is the Jordan River, which is the national boundary between the Kingdom of Jordan and the State of Israel. And on the Jordanian side was a young fellow in military uniform with a large weapon. And on the Israeli side were two young fellows in military uniforms with large weapons. Uh, and they were just there to make sure that everybody stayed on their side. And everything was fine as long as you stayed on your side. Um, when you drive to the Jordan, you go down a long road and on both sides are these very tall fences with yellow signs with a large red triangle on them. And if you go up to one of the signs, you'll see danger mines in three languages. And those mines are there to protect the national boundary between Israel and Jordan and make sure that the mines that are on the Israeli side are to make sure that the um, Palestinians, the Muslims, the Jordanians are not going to invade from the east and I'm confident that there are mines on the other side to make sure that the Israelis are not going to invade from the West. And there's something about driving to the baptismal site of Jesus, literally through a minefield, and past two young people. Um, Israel has national service requirements, so probably 19, 20 years old, sitting there with their cell phones, text messaging with a subautomatic machine gun over their shoulder. It was this evidence of the conflict right there, but then when you were down by the water, it took no imagination whatsoever to put yourself there with John the Baptist and with Jesus. And there's something in that for me, of this juxtaposition of the violence that's there, and that yet that is the exact spot that God chose to show greatest mercy. Um, it's the case that the Dead Sea, which, into which the Jordan River flows, is the lowest place on earth. Jordan River is among the lowest places on earth, many hundreds of feet below sea level. And it was at the place, it was at the lowest place that God chose to show the most mercy, the most grace, the most kindness. And I think that's worth our holding on to. Um, I am not going to presume to speak for all of the pilgrims in the room uh, but would anyone like to ask a question to which we might respond or any comments or feedback? Carmen, please come up. I'll let you speak. <laughs> I, when I look and it takes me back a few months, I want to make a plug. I would go back tomorrow. It was that inspiring and that meaningful, and there's so much that you haven't seen. The Stations of the Cross was particularly meaning to me, meaningful to me. We met at seven o'clock in the morning. We were in the old city. Things weren't moving just quite yet, and we took turns carrying the cross from station to station, and each cross, someone read the scripture from that time, I don't think that will ever leave my mind. I want you to know how secure we felt. Bashara is all of our best friend. We are Facebook friends. He is lovely. But he also had eyes in the back of his head. He never was still from moment to moment. I, I never worried, but he was so well respected amongst his city friends, whatever you call them. Everyone, everyone. We got in places, we were met with kindness. We were staying next to the police station. We were staying in a college that has the architecture similar to Rhodes. It was lovely. Inside this walled community, we were staying in a dormitory. We were back in the college days. It was the Yes, yes. <laughs> and Bill and I stayed in the dorm room. The food was delicious. And there was this little bitty boy who came each morning, and he was coming to the school that was right across the street. His father was the chef. He was our friend. 
we could not have been accepted more warmly. So warmly that I told Bill, I'm going back. So if you want to go back with me, I'm going two years. anyone else like to share? Hester, please. I'm going to follow up on the cathedral that was in the background of the roof picture. Um, so that was the, the site that is believed to be um, the Annunciation, uh, where the angel came and asked Mary if she would do this impossible thing. And, um, you know, you would see people going through in all the sites saying, this is where this happened, this is where this happened, this is where this happened. And, and I'm kind of a historical skeptic. I'm like, well, how do you know? Do you have proof? Can you show it to me? What I loved about our tour was that he said, this is where this has been venerated for years. This is where we honor that this did happen. So whether it is the exact cave where it happened or not, this is where we honor that that moment took place in our lives and in our spiritual journey. So at the, uh, the place of the Annunciation, the question that Bashara and Greg asked of us is, what is God asking you to do? What are you being called to do that seems impossible in your life? And are you going to say yes, as Mary did? Hester shared that um, sometimes you're going to the sites where, where our faith has chosen to revere something or chosen to remember something. And it's so helpful to think in that way of breaking it from, I need to stand on the patch of dirt that Jesus that has a little sandal footprint remaining in it, or my experience isn't there. Um, the, places that, the places that are revered as the spot have had churches built on top of them so many times. Um, Constantine's mother showed up in the fourth century with Constantine's checkbook to buy historic sites and to build churches on them. Um, and you can imagine, you come into one of these impoverished towns with the emperor's checkbook and you say, I'm looking for holy sites. Oh, I have a holy site to show you right here. This is, I'll, I'll get you one, no problem. Um, but where God snuck up, where God really snuck up on me were the places that weren't developed in that way. Um, it was that the house under the Sisters of Nazareth, where she said, this might have been Jesus's house, it might not have been, but certainly he would have been playing here with his friends. Um, when we were in Bethsaida and they, were, um, they had four or five visible layers of excavation out of something like 20 that they had found. So we entered through the old city gates, which would have been lost and unknown by the days of Jesus. So Jesus was walking on top of them and didn't know that they were there. And then you go around the corner to the place where they had left the first century dwellings, and they said, okay, this is Bethsaida, which is where um, Andrew and the sons of Zebedee and the fishermen were to be from. We know that we're in the first century. We know that we've got a first century path here. So that path is the only road into the city. So you can be pretty sure that Jesus walked on it. And then here are two houses in which we found fishing equipment. Do we know that it was Andrew's house? No but we know that there's first century fishing equipment in a first century ruin in Bethsaida at the edge of where the sea was then. And that was, those were the kinds of places where God snuck up on me, where you could just put yourself there. No one was trying to make a claim that it wasn't. This was not Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus said, please do not build booths for Moses and Elijah, and they have built a church with a chapel to Moses and a chapel to Elijah. It's not that. It's just this quiet spot out on, the side of the, out on the side of the lake. And in fact, the water has receded, so you're not even as close to the lake as you might be. Julie. I was trying to get out of the way. Um, the... Uh, the the uh, Anglican Church in the Middle East, our friends, do not yet uh, recognize the ordination of women for cultural reasons largely. Um, and so we were told when Susan and Hester and I all arrived as ordained people that um, I could participate in the liturgical life at the cathedral, but that the ladies could not. And that was a bit grumbly. And then the dean said, um, however, when we're out in the country, 
the bishop has what the Americans would call a don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> and as long as he isn't looking at it, we can do whatever we want out in the country. And the Sisters of Nazareth, they're a group of feisty nuns. <laughs> Um, and so there's a, there's a lot, there was a lot of interesting back and forth on that. Um, I'll take one last comment or question and then I uh, have a quick wrap up comment and then we'll go on to church. Julie. Yeah, you talk about, I mean, that, that you were looking at the, the So the most reverend Sahail Diwani is the Anglican Archbishop in Jerusalem. And you'll note that I say Archbishop in Jerusalem, not Archbishop of Jerusalem. And that has a piece of, of history there um, and the, the sort of back and forth between faith traditions. Um, he was only recently recognized as an Archbishop as the gift of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Before that, he was just the Bishop of Jerusalem in the Middle East, Bishop in Jerusalem in the Middle East. But his uh, territory has, I think they have 30 or so congregations, which is similar in size to West Tennessee, but they, they reside in, I think, five countries. And in order to get across boundaries, one has to go through national checkpoints. Um, we were advised when we came into Tel Aviv, which is where you fly into Israel, um, and uh, that we shouldn't get our passport stamped. Because if we should go into Muslim countries at another time, that will attract attention or have us uh, rejected if our if stamp is there. So they gave us our visa with a paper clip that we could put in and then take out uh, at the end. Well, Bishop Diwani um, needs to go into Egypt and needs to go into Jordan and needs to go into Syria uh, and places where it's not easy to travel. Um, and he is, I'm trying to remember if he is not an Israeli. I can't remember what his citizenship is. But his passage was being prohibited. And so the King of Jordan gave him diplomatic status uh, in the, uh, under the authority of the King of Jordan, who is the protector of the Christian church in the Middle East. And you can think about that for a moment that the king of Jordan, king of a Muslim country, himself a Muslim, who gave the $8 million to put gold leaf all over the Dome of the Rock, is the protector of the Christian church in the Middle East. Um, and for Bishop Diwani to be able to have diplomatic privileges, to be able to travel across borders, uh, is the gift of the Muslim kingdom next door. Um, one thing I'll add that we did not do on this trip, which I think was an unfortunate loss for us, but just as a matter of time, um, on the longer expeditions, you get to spend a day with the church. So not looking at holy sites, but going to the church sites. Um, and what the Anglican Church in Jerusalem in the Middle East has chosen to do is realize that they are not going to solve the Middle East conflict. And so instead, they're creating the middle space and they've created hospitals where anybody can be treated, and they've created schools where anybody can be educated, and they are creating that middle space to say we really can all get along here, and I think that's perhaps the best thing that we can do. I need to end it here because we've got to get to church, but I'm going to put in a plug. Wait, 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 wait. It's like the teacher saying, well, and in conclusion, they all go before the bell. Um, I, I certainly hope to go back. Uh, and I certainly hope to go back with parishioners. Um, my aim is to do that in about three years' time. So that would be spring of 2019. Um, and if anybody is empty nesting between now and then or wasn't able to go for one reason or another, I really encourage you to think about it and pray about it. Um, it's not inexpensive to go, but I'll tell you that we got the price down just as far as we possibly could. Um, this time around, I think it was $5,000 all-inclusive. So that was air and meals for 10 days and transportation, admission and tuition, all of that. Um, but I just really encourage you, it might be something you need to plan for, but it's a trip that is the trip of a lifetime. Um, I will only go in the company of St. George's. We are not going to stay at the King David Hotel. Uh, if you want to go on the fancy tourism ride, uh, I'm sure that your travel agent will be glad to book you. Um, but we go as pilgrims, and we live modestly, um, and we enjoy each other's company. And if you'd like to give that a try, we'll be going again in about three years' time. Um, without further ado, <laughs> start training, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, Lots of stairs and lots of old cobbled roads. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, thank you all so, so much for this. We're going to do, we have two weeks of um, separated classes coming up. So we're going to have an upstairs class and a downstairs class. The upstairs class is 
14th century English mystics with Dr. Gillian Clee. The downstairs class is on caregiving and caregivers being offered by Samaritan Counseling. Uh, and then after those, we're going to have a two-week series with reports back from our youth pilgrims, who I'm recognizing over in the side, uh, and we'll do the same thing. Hester will teach one week, and the pilgrims will offer their reflection the next week. So we have just a lot going on and a lot coming. Uh, please do come back, but please right now transition towards the church. We'll start in 12 minutes.